and the Garden Expansion slips the 1500 foot sweep dredging project. Please go on. The contractor on this project, their time started on December 1st. We gave them a notice to proceed. They have not started their work yet. We don't anticipate really them being out there until right after the holidays. So. Okay. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you, John. Okay, moving on to airport projects versus airport uh, aircraft operations. Joe Wheeler. All right, for the month of November, we had uh, 2,122 aircraft operations, 7,325 passengers and planed, and uh, 16,310 vehicles on Airport Road. I would like to note this was a little bit more of a normal month for operations, uh, but we are still, compared to last year, about 6,000 operations off the pace. Um, so with that, you all have any questions? Any questions? Thank you. Thank you, Joe. And the Airport Connector Road and Bridge Project, PCOLA and Associates. Joe. Uh, yeah, our, all of our project plans are complete. It's all approved by DOTD. Uh, we have all the environmental um, permitting done. Uh, we still have the Coast Guard permit to be approved, but uh, the local offices pretty much approved it and sent it up to Washington, D.C. for signatures. So we expect to have that fairly soon. Um, DOTD has tentatively set up a letting date of either January 13th or February 10th, depending on how right-of-way acquisition goes, and, and Bryce is working on the right-of-ways. All right, so all of the offers have been made on the 12 parcels we need to acquire to, to construct this project. Uh, we've started signing some of the acts of sale to, uh, to, to acquire these properties. And that's what we're working on right now. Any questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Uh, moving on to other projects. We have the Tidal Creek. Chairman, we have to go to a public comment. We have a public comment. We have a here. public comment section. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Martin. Okay, other projects. Uh, Tidal Creek Bridge and Culvert Improvements, PCO Land Associates. Uh, yeah, lowland constructions, the contractor, uh, we gave them the notice to proceed on November 30th. He's starting to move in this week. Um, he's going to work on the kayak launch area and extension of the culvert at the front marina. Uh, he did put on order the concrete bridge that goes over to Tidal Creek. Uh, so that's going to take some time to come in, but he's gonna, you're going to start to see some work fairly soon on this project. Any questions? Okay, uh, the front commercial marina boat shed and lift, GIS engineering. PCOLA Construction is the contractor on this project. Uh, they have given us the construction contracts <coughs> to sign, and we brought that to the Port Commission this morning for a CHET signature. Okay. After which, we'll probably get them started again beginning of January or so. Okay. Any questions? Thank you, Thank you. Okay, last thing, uh, well, a couple more things, but uh, on our list is the um, WERDA update, Water Resource Development <coughs> Act update. Um, we talked about that on Monday evening. We've been talking about that pretty much most of the year. Um, <coughs> the House uh, in Congress, uh, the House did pass the WERDA bill yesterday afternoon, uh, and that was the, the um, amended word of bill where the conference brought it together and the, both the Senate um, uh, staff and the House staff got together, worked on the bill, uh, ironed out some differences they had. Fortunately enough, there was no differences on our project, so our project is in the bill. Again, it was passed by the House um, and is now on its way to the Senate. That should be passed prior to the uh, Christmas recess. Uh, I want to thank our congressional delegation uh, Congressman Scalise, but in particular, 
Congressman Gary Graves, who really did a lot of heavy lifting to get our project put into the bill originally several months back when it was originally passed. So I want to thank them for that. And um, again, this gives us authorization as soon as the Senate passes it this will, and signed by the President, this will give us authorization to go to 30 feet, uh, authorized to 30 feet in Bell Pass and Bayou Lafourche and our northern expansion. Okay. Thank you for that. And uh, one last thing I wanted to mention, it's not on the agenda, so I just wanted to briefly mention it, is the Bell Pass emergency dredging that has taken place. You see a picture there. Uh, it's a Corps of Engineers project. Crosby Dredge is in there handling that dredge. They started um, the actual dredging process a week later than uh, anticipated, but that did start last Thursday, and they are currently moving very well on that dredge project. All right, we anticipate having one lane of full depth <coughs> traffic uh, capable towards the end of next week, into next weekend. Okay, all right. And then next is, um, we have a presentation from um, Bessie Director, Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement Director, Scott Angel. He's certainly not uh, <laughs> unfamiliar to us. He's been here numerous times. We know him, we know him well. And we certainly thank you, Director Angel, for being here today. Thank you, Chet. Good to see my friends. Good to be in God's country. And I know it's hard for all of us in these times, so thank you for your leadership. Uh, I think you'll be uh, happy to see some of the things I'll report to you. I'm here not to talk about politics, but to talk about performance, and in particular your performance and what you do and how important it is to everybody in America. And often that is forgotten that everybody who has a need to heat their homes or cool their homes or buy fuel, uh, transportation fuel, is connected in some kind of way to this port commission. And what you do is important when you think of the fact that 15% of America's oil comes from the Gulf of Mexico. And, uh, you know, a lot of concern right now about what's going on and what's the direction. I'm here to tell you that Ten years after the worst environmental disaster in the history of the country, that if America wishes to score where are we going to invest all in gas dollars, that the Gulf of Mexico on an environmental criteria will win every day. And I'll show you some things why I believe that's true. So when I started this presentation, we talked about it being America's number one energy port. And I had to do a little bit more research, and I sent it to the school teacher, and you see what the school teacher did, scratched out Americas and put worlds. So congratulations, Louisiana. We got a great uh, reputation for being first in a lot of things, uh, and maybe last in some other things. Uh, it's very, very heartwarming to know, as a country boy, as a Cajun, that not only do we have a head coach at our flagship university who sounds like you and sounds like me and represents the Cajun nation in an incredible way, number one, yet we here today in that same area recognizing the world's number one energy port. You ought to stop for a moment during these holiday seasons and, and, and just recognize how special that is because it's really, really important. And it's not just important to Baton Rouge and New Orleans and where I'm from in Acadiana. It's important to everybody in America. And I'll show you why. So again, we sent a report out to you. Hopefully you got it in the mail. If not, it's coming. Uh, I'd encourage you to read the insert up there. The insert is unbelievable when you stop and think that 10 years after the worst environmental disaster in the history of the country, we have successfully rebranded We've rebranded American offshore energy. Why is that? Well, we went to work, you went to work, I went to work, others went to work, and we've been able to show America that we know how to do three things at one time, not two things at one time. You know, what, what, as a kid, my dad would say, you know, you gotta do more than one thing at a time. We do three things at one time. We have safe operations, we have environmentally sustainable operations, and we have robust production. It's not either or. None of us come from either or families. We're not gonna do it this way or do it that way. We know what the word and means, and the insert shows that we've had incredible production, 2019, highest offshore oil production in the history of the country. In terms of oil spill, if we take a look at, it, uh, at the top of there, the, the, the fact is the matter that in 20, 19, the ratio of volume spilled 
to volume produced, it was approximately 17 tablespoons in an Olympic sized swimming pool. You don't read that anywhere, but it's incredible when you take a look at the volume of oil that you helped produce in the Gulf of Mexico to the volume that was spilled from active operations, 17 tablespoons in an Olympic sized swimming pool. It's incredible, incredible. In fact, that's less oil that's, than, than, than is spilled on onshore operations. Okay? Last year, and for several years, we've had the second safest high hazard industry in America when you measure incident rates. That doesn't mean we don't have bad days. We have bad days, we have tough days. But overall, when you look at the year, we have been able to consistently produce the second safest high, uh, se second safest record among high hazard industries in America. We second only to the nuclear power generation industry when it comes to incident rates on a safety standpoint. That's something you should be proud of because let's face it, at the end of the day, those people that put on those hard hats and the steel toe boots and kiss their families goodbye, they look like you, they sound like you, they, they are you, you see them in church, you see them at the ball game, you know their family, so it's important we do the right thing. So from an environmental standpoint, let me add a little bit more. A lot of talk about greenhouse gases. So greenhouse gases are, are, are again, uh, emphasized when it comes to methane production. Methane that is flared and vented into the atmosphere. Again, for the last several years, we've had consistently producing a ratio of less than 1.25% of flaring or venting of, of, of methane compared to our produced gas. That's the best in America. So when it comes to climate change, when it comes to those kind of things that that conversation is happening, we all part of that conversation, generally believed to be driven by uh, a lot of methane being flared and vented into the atmosphere, the Gulf of Mexico has had an incredible performance. Why is that? I think it's because of solid regulations and the fact that we have a vibrant and robust pipeline system that we get to take advantage of. Again, all things that you all help make, make, make happen. Uh, when it comes to marine mammals, when it comes to marine mammals, and, and I, I will sh say this what, as the son of the former Secretary of Wildlife and Fisheries in the state of Louisiana, I'm not so sure that I was so concerned about the fatality of a marine mammal 10 years ago, 20 years ago. I guess we were all kind of raised where if you worked offshore and there was an incidental fatality of a marine mammal, somebody started cutting the onions in the bell pepper and we were going to talk about Kubion, <laughs> right? But we've become more and more and more aware, and I'm here to tell you since 2017, since 2017, we don't have a single report of an incidental fatality of a marine mammal or a sea turtle as a result of oil and gas operations offshore. You ought to be proud of that because you helped make that possible, okay? And, and, and certainly when we talk about the amount of money, we're talking about $5.7 billion of money to the federal treasury. That goes to pay a few bills. And you know, I guess when you start talking about thousands and millions and trillions and billions, somehow along the way, it's just a number. Well, that's a lot of numbers, okay? So we did the right thing the right way. We started in uh, April of 2017. The president executed an executive order. And again, I think it's important to look at how, how uh, articulate this executive order is. It shall be the policy of the U.S. to encourage energy e and including on the OCS, in order to maintain the nation's position <laughs> as a global energy leader and foster energy security and resilience for the benefit of the American people while ensuring that any such activity is safe and environmentally responsible. Who can disagree with that? That's not about a company. That's not about company A or company B or company C. It's about the American people. And who wouldn't want us to do things to make sure that we fostered uh, our, our position <coughs> and did it safely and responsible? So I, I inherited a, a, a report when I got there from the Governmental Accountability Office that said we needed stronger leadership at, at Department of Interior regarding overshot, oversight. Well, we gave it to them, okay? I started in uh, my first uh, email on May the 26th to all of our employees is I am reminded that the real definition of teamwork is common people accomplishing uncommon things. 
I am confident working together we can and will be the generation of Americans that transforms Bessie into what America demands we do, and that is to be more than just the either or agency. And again, it's about doing all of them because we know how to walk and chew gum and do a few other things at the same time. So this shows the production, if you take a look, uh, at that, that middle column, which is the blue, is the highest oil production we've ever had. Natural gas production down. We got so much natural gas in America, and that's primarily something that occurs on the shelf, and we know the shelf has had a struggle. But the highest oil production in the, offshore in the history of the country. And again, this is just kind of walking you through it. 2010, many speculated that America had to make a choice. We're either going to be one or the other. In 2017, a we can do it all approach commences. In 2020, an improved brand emerges. And those, those statistics are pretty clear. Again, I, I kind of focused on them at the very beginning. Uh, less consistently, a ratio of less than 1.25% of flared and vented gas, zero incidental marine mammal takes. Less oil spilled in 2018 and 19 from active ENP operations on the federal offshore in at least a quarter of a century. And you have the, the volume there that we've done. Safe operations, I talked about the second safest high, second safest performance. Again, don't take my word for it. That's coming from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And again, second to only the nuclear power generation. And you all know how I've, I've been very vibrant about how I believe that it's about the Boudreaux and the Thibodeau. I wasn't responsible for the, for the spelling on this. So for those Boudreaux that are in here, uh, I, that's misspelled. It's not Boudreaux, it's Boudreaux, there's no R there. But I do think it's about keeping the Boudreaux, the Thibodeaux, the Cheremies, the Gisclairs, the Calais, the Melosons. Uh, I need a little help with that next one, the Lafont, the Pierces, and the Griffiths. Help me with that, that what, what is that? Uh, Ardon. Say it? Ardon. Ardon, okay, all right. Well, it's about, you know, I, I did my homework, right? I didn't, I, I should have I practiced a little bit more, but anyway. So it's about keeping our people safe. At the end of the day, if our people are not safe, and we don't care about the industry, right? And again, this goes to show you the, the combined uh, recordable incident rates just keep going down and down and down. And, and again, that's important because we got to take care of the frequency. It doesn't mean we don't have bad days. We've been, we've been very, very vibrant in our inspections. We've taken care of going out there and making sure that we are, we're doing the right thing. And when it comes to, to, to making sure near misses, you know, in America right now, if there's a near miss on an airline, if an airline has a near miss, there's no incident, but it almost happened, they require to report it. They require to report it. That's not how it is when it comes to oil and gas. There, there, but we instituted, a, uh, the, the previous administration instituted a voluntary program, and I inherited that at a 4% participation, and I now got it at 86%, and we need to get it at 100%. Every near miss should be reported so everybody can learn by it, right? And, and so we're, we're focusing on that. One of the things we did that I'm most proud of is that we instituted, and I'll ask you to join, we'll give you a little card, I'll ask you to join, it's free. You put in your cell number, and you get from us Every time we issue a safety alert, you get it. We're the only workplace regulator, or we were the first, we may be others now, we're the first workplace, re workplace regulator on the planet to issue a direct safety alert to an employee on the front line. Everybody else goes to the company, the company looks at it, they send it to their team, their team looks at it, before you know it, six months, eight months might go before somebody on the front line sees it. We the only industry in, 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 we were the first industry, let me say, and at one time I used to say only, but I'm not sure others haven't joined it. We now have 6,900 as of this morning, I think it's a little bit closer to 7,000 people who have joined up to receive those safety alerts. Those are the workers. The only way we can learn and to basically modify behavior is make sure that, that folks have the information. And so I go around and I see people and they're very, very thankful. Again, that's 7,000 lives that are getting that information so they can be aware of what's happening. But in addition to 7,000 lives, that's 14,000 ears and 14,000 eyes and 14,000 hands and 14,000 wrists and knees and feet, all very, very, you know, we, it's not just about saving a life. Obviously, we want to do that, but we want to save, prevent an injury as well. So it's very, very important. Again, an example of a safety alert. Very actionable, very easy to read. Our folks understand it. I hear a lot of great things about it. But safety never ends, so we're working on a few other initiatives. I'll run through that. 
and, and, and when we come to the royalties, let's take a look at the royalties, the increased <coughs> royalty payments to the government. From 17 to 18, it went from 3.8 to 5.2 billion, and from 18 to 19, 5.2 to 5.7. It's incredible what, what, what happens here. But I want to spend a little bit of time on something I've been working uh, with, with Chet on, I kind of recognize some data. If you just think of the deep water, there are a total of 753 wells. All right, that's not a lot of wells. Deep water, 753 producing wells. And Bessie estimates that the average royalty rate, if we just break it down, that these wells individually produce to America, to America is about five million. So if you want more money, you need more wells. To get more wells, you gotta drill more wells, right? And I have a little bit of note at the bottom there that says that Shell's Ursa claims the top spot with 370 million as far as uh, a platform is concerned. And uh, on a per well basis, it's BP's, BP Thunder Horse. Where is that production coming from? I mentioned the number of wells. Where is that production coming from? 50% of our production, deep water, comes from 13% of our facilities. Nine facilities offshore are responsible for half of our production. Another nine are responsible for the next 25, and then the, re the remaining 50 are responsible for, for the last uh, 25%. So the breakdown is not across. There's a few big facilities that are really, really, really uh, ringing the cash register for America. A couple observations, and I, I know that we're on the time clock, so I want to be respectful of your time, and I'll probably go on over, but it wouldn't be the first time. Uh, so, I said earlier that we had the highest production we ever had in 2019. <clears throat> So you might be saying, well, that's good. We had a good year. But you got to look a little deeper. <clears throat> and I'm reminded of Ford Motor Company not too long ago having a pretty good year. And at the same time, they had a pretty good year. They announced that they're getting out of the sedan business. Well, why are you getting out of the sedan business if you had a pretty good year? Because the, the way they were selling trucks and SUVs and vans were, were giving them some really high top line numbers. But it was camouflaging the poor performance of the sedan division. So they decided to get out. They're getting out. I don't know if they're out yet, but they're getting out. I say that just as an example. Our top line num number was real good. And we got 68 deep water facilities. But we got some that are not as good as they could be. We got some that represent that Ford sedan division, if you would. We have a conundrum. We have had the highest production we ever had in, 19, in 2019. But hang in there with me on that third bullet point. Approximately four out of the five deep water facilities, or 53 of the 68, are producing less than 50% of their nameplate design capacity. That's the part of what I'm talking about, the sedan division right there. 24 of those 68 are producing less than 10%. 24 of our 68 facilities are at a single digit with regards to their capacity design and what they're actually flowing through. What does that mean? Think of utilization rate capacities as how you would look at an occupancy rate for a hotel. An occupancy rate for a hotel, if it has 100 rooms and they got 10 rooms that were rented the night before, they had an occupancy rate of 10%. We got 24 of our 68 facilities that look like that, <coughs> that need some help. Because this top line number that we did real good is only temporary if we don't recognize that we have some of these facilities in trouble. The next bullet point, the average time elapsed since highest oil production achieved on those deep water facilities is 14 years. So we got to get more dollars invested in the drill bit to make that happen. And it's time for smarter policy. I'm going to run through this really quick. <coughs> Many of you uh, perhaps uh, saw uh, here recently, we, we had a press release that went out on it. If you have a sunk facility, if you have the cost of a facility that costs 500 million or a billion dollars, and you're not using it to its capacity, most business people would tell you that, that just doesn't make sense. So I had Bohm look at what is the geology around these platforms, these 68 platforms, and they came back to me and said, there's about 211 
billion with a B, $211 billion worth of resources that are within 30 to 60 miles of each one of those platforms. If you put, not each, combined platforms, okay? So you're like, okay, we got, we got a lot of product and we got a platform, why, 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 we not, why our utilization rate is not higher? And one of the things that we learned is that when you drill wells that are 25, 30, 35, 40 miles away from the platform, the formation pressure can't flow it to the, plat to the mother platform. So you gotta install subsea pumping. So I'm not an engineer and I'm like, okay, well you gotta put subsea pumping in. Let's put some subsea pumping in. They're like, well, it's not that easy. I'm like, well, what you mean it's not that easy? Well, you don't just go to Home Depot or Napa Know How and get a long extension cord. It's a little bit more complicated than that. Because when you put a pump in, you gotta have electricity to run the pump. So you gotta electrify the seafloor. So I'm like, well, why didn't they do that? Well, we did a little research and 75 to $150 million to electrify the seafloor, to be able to put in subsea pumping, to be able to get that formation, prep, that, that product to flow to that mother platform. Okay, well, how are we gonna make that work? Well, it just doesn't work. So I went back to Bohm, they are economics expert, and they are indicating to us that we should be able to offer a lower royalty rate to a company that wants to install what is called flow assurance. Lower royalty rates help to pay for that 75 to 150 million. <coughs> America gets the production. America gets the royalty that they wouldn't otherwise get. We create the jobs. It's smart po policy. I think it's coming to a zip code near you. I hope so. But when it, I want to give you a little bit of hope. When it comes to, when it comes to, uh, to, to how we're trying to figure all this out, where we not sure if oil and gas has a future in America. Offshore oil and gas has a future in America. Why? Because you perform the right way. Industry has made it their, their business, the regulator has made it their business, and the results are very clear when it comes to the environment, when it comes to the production, when it comes to the safety, we check all those boxes. Again, we're not finished, and as I said in my report, c'est pas fini, we got more work to do, there is work to be done, we can always strive for better, but I'm here to share with you, I'm here to thank you, I'm here to compliment you on your performance. America has no idea how important you all are. America has no idea, but the best director knows how important you are, and I'm here to thank you all. Have any, you got any questions? I know a couple of y'all been looking at the at, at the clock there yeah, when I went. No. Well, I, I don't know what that meant. I don't know what that meant, but anyway. Yeah. All right, to Jim. Do you talk in your sleep? <laughs> well, you know, uh, that's what she said. Yeah. And has anybody any questions? No, but thank you, Mr. Angel, for Very taking normal. time out from your busy schedule to, to come here and, and, and speak to us and, and our audience today. Uh, we pr truly appreciate that. Well, y'all deserve to be thanked. Uh, it's, it's incredible what y'all do here. I was, I was here a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, with the Deputy Secretary for the Department of Energy and the Deputy Secretary for the Department of Interior, and they all have familiarity, had been here before, but were basically blown away at, at just the, the sophistication uh, of this group and, and what y'all do and how y'all do it. And look, we're gonna keep fighting. Uh, I, I certainly believe that uh, there's a place. Uh, we all, I think, come from a generation that believes that, you know, it can be all of the above. It doesn't have to be one type of energy. It ought to be all of the above. Uh, but I I'm, I'm promise you the Gulf of Mexico can be a winner if we stay focused on you know, the performance of safety and environmental sustainability. Thank you all very much. Thank, Thank you. you. I appreciate it, Mr. Angel. Thank you all. Thank you. All right, public yep. comment. I know we have, oh, we have uh, Mr. Mr. Faze. Mike Faze. 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 Faze is here oh, okay, uh, come on. to give us a, a briefing. I'm not Mike, we know it's a tough act to follow, but we know you can do it. Oh, it's very tough. <laughs> All I can say is Louisiana is the heartbeat of America, and that's Thank what I've are. been saying for years. So, you know, and he, he well explained that. I guess what I'm here to do today is just kind of tell you a little bit about the special session. One of the things we did do, the governor implemented some, some emergency powers that kind of put a stiff leg on all of our businesses. So as the legislature tried to kind of give us, the people, a little bit more say so, we were unsuccessful. Uh, but we'll keep trying and try again after all this is over with because uh, we need to keep our businesses open and uh, use common sense on those things. Uh, with that, cre uh, created a pretty bad deficit, um, you know, in, in, in the budget as far as our unemployment. Our unemployment uh, had a kitty uh, kind of set aside of over a billion dollars. 
which uh, as of uh, this past month, it would have totally wiped out that, that money. So what we had to do is go back in and we uh, were able to kind of uh, move around some money from the CARES Act and stuff and was able to take $85 million and put it back into unemployment. So we, wouldn't, we would have had to raise taxes on all the businesses up to $60 million worth. So basically we did that because we know business is already hurting and uh, there's no way they could afford it to, for the unemployment tax to triple, quadruple or whatever it may have been. So we've got that accomplished. On a good note, September our unemployment in the state of Louisiana was 7.9 percent. October it went down to 6.9, and November down to 6.7. So if we can keep that trend going by using common sense and getting businesses back opened up and not shutting down uh, the whole economy, because I know I know COVID's a very bad situation. We've lost a lot of good people in it. But at the same time, you've got a 99.7% recovery rate with what we know today and, and how to handle it. So I think businesses need to kind of get things going back in the right direction so we can uh, keep things from going and in, 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 uh, get our, our money available for next year that we won't have a bad year because at the rate we are right now, uh, unemployment, uh, we need to get it down quickly because I know none of us can afford going to two or three times the unemployment rate like back in the early 80s. <laughs> we all felt that and we don't want to have to go through that again. And on the other note, uh, the biggest thing I can say is uh, we, we, we worked hard uh, throughout the special session to put some things in that COVID has brought to the state that uh, a lot of things we're unfamiliar with and how to handle. And uh, one of the things I did do, uh, you know, which uh, for my first session, I was lucky enough to get uh, amendment number seven passed, which was uh, having the unclaimed money go into a special bucket that is gonna go back to the people because I always felt it was the people's money and that the legislature shouldn't be playing with that money and doing what they want with it. So we were very successful in doing that. And so that was a big challenge. The treasurer had been trying to get that bill passed for the last four years. And uh, he wanted a rookie to try it, and we got it done. And so that's what I'm planning to do for us for the rest of the term. Go out and make a difference. Thank y'all. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Mike. Appreciate it. All right. Now we're going to public comment. Tell me, tell me. Now we're going to public comment. Public comments are three minutes a person. So anyone has any public comments? Mr. Martin, come to the mic, please. Councilman, Senator, A. Scott brought me back memories in the 70s. Your dad was Bert Angel, Thank you. head of wildlife and fishery, and I was the chairman of the middle board. Thank you. And I tell you what, you. we had some good times. We did some things. Back in the 70s, they had lines at service station. Couldn't get any gas. So the state had to do some things that we didn't want to do. But we did. We had to change the Scott, the, uh, the, uh, all of the lease form, got it to have in-kind oil. We did a whole bunch of stuff, and your dad was a big part of that, of that changing that lease form. So good to see you again. Bring back memory. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. President, member of the commissioner, I would like to thank you for having the opportunity to, give, to, uh, to read this letter from Mr. Henry. Lafon, which is my attorney. He was, he was requested to go to the court this morning and could not make this meeting. He asked me to go ahead and try to meet this meeting. So the letter that you, you have, some of the wording might be a little bit different because I'm reading it because of, because of Henry. I respond to to you on your latest offer concerning the purchase of my property and the buy tour of my property, which is the office building. It is important for this community to understand that I am not opposed to this project and the fact of embracing it and would be would to see the final thing to happen. 
I have cooperated unconditionally to resolve the matter. But with that being said, I feel that it is necessary for everyone in this community to understand this process began in 2006. As I stated, this process in 2006, when a, the port approached me about purchasing my property for building a new bridge and to connect 3235 with LA-1. This would also direct contact, connect 3235 to Leonard Millard uh, Airport yeah. Road. Then the project shifted to Lafouche Parish in 2015. In fact, Mr. Bard had an agreement with the, with the administration of Lafouche Parish and through the council agreed that there were money to be obtained. The final agreement was not reached because Mr. Daniel Rain, our Councilman Daniel Rain, had a motion, could not get a second. Approximately two years ago, the port then took over the project, which involved DOTD, state government, and federal government. This project concerned two, prop two properties. The office of the Batur, which is owned by my son Ace Martin, and the residence and my real estate was owned by me, which actually be the road project in question. Since the project began in 2006, the property involved has been appraised numerous times. Let's consider these different offers of appraisal. The appraisal on the office building on July the 2nd was a July the 2nd, 2001. Ms. Velma well, Realtor. Three minutes left. Huh? You have three minutes left. I'm extending your time. I'm giving you six minutes. You have three minutes left. The realtor for Ms. from Mrs. Galliano, from Galliano, Louisiana, was $197,000. September the 9th, Neon, which the port hired for the Lafayette of 269. On January the 16th, Andrew Martin, Mark Prejean, and Brian Prejean did an, did an appraisal for $284,000. On March the 28th, Andrew Martin and Parish Government did a, an appraisal of $309,000. On March the 27th, authorized by the port, Brian LaRose at Homa for $53,000. On May the 27th, authorized by the port, performed by Bennett Uber for $45,000. August the 20th, appraised by the Lafouche Parish was $295,000. I'm cutting the chart, y'all. I told me I got too, that much time. So this is my appraisal on my property. On 2009, by Neon was $500,000. Uh, 542,000 on December the 12th, 2008. Lafouche Parish, Lafouche appraisal was $1,200,000. On February 17, 2009, the port and, and Andrew Martin Acadian appraisal was 912,000. And the Lafouche Parish uh, appraisal for, for, uh, for Mark Prejean and Brian Prejean was 1,250,000. The appraisal from the Lafouche Parish government and myself was $1,250,000. On May the 27th, uh, Brian Uber from Destrahan by the port was $257,000. On May the 27th, the port, Brian LaRose, was $241,000. On August the 4th, appraised by Lafouche Parish for Andrew Martin was a million dollars. Now, this is the last round of negotiation we had for the last two years, have agreed appraisal obtained an uh, agreement that we had by, by December 2019. We did not get that appraisal was until May of 2020. We started early to cooperate unconditionally to resolve this matter. I think the port, along with the community, can understand my frustration for the port, appraised, resident, and property for $912,000 in 2009 and $257,000 in 2020, a $650,000 difference. 
And the, and the parents, which these appraisal consists of the appraisal and local living. The local appraisal that I have is a local person that lives one and a half miles from my house, a long life resident of Galliana, Louisiana, who knows the community and consistent from the from those who live in Destrehan, home of Lafayette, and Thibodeau. The port uh, original was $53,000 for the bought there in the office building, $257,000. For the uh, for my resident in the estate, and I kind of offer with three hundred forty-five thousand for the office building, and one million one hundred thousand dollars for the real estate. One uh, about on or about October the thirteenth, the port uh, made me an offer of two hundred seventy-five thousand dollars for the office, and four hundred seventy thousand dollars for for my, my residence and real estate, with an eighty-one thousand dollars moving cost. Negotiating continued on November the 9th, which the office was uh, uh, offered for $148,000 by the port and $652,000 by the, by the port. Finally, on November the 23rd, $243,000 or $242,500, a resident of real estate, which the numbers of the letter is a little confusing but there was no offer on the, on the office. It should be noted that offer was made also for 5C, which is my mother's succession of the estate, and then I am the independent executor contacting, any contact would be through me. Mr. Martin has offered the support because of appraisal of the report stated that he based on a fair market value and is no value replacement cost. For example, my 1,200 square foot pool house property was, was valued by the port for $2,500, a 1,200 square feet uh, pool house. In addition, no value considered in location and safety and environmental. Another reason for the reaction for this offer has not even cover the attach of my real estate, the lien on my real estate. Those lien would apply to the real estate in my transaction and any other expropriation taking place, the port would take with the property free and clear from, but I would still be responsible for my lien on my property. I don't think anyone would consider that's fair. I would appear that this matter is leading to litigation report of expropriation of my property and, H and the office building property. This is the last thing I want, including myself, would want to be, want to happen. With that stated, I would do, I will do what I can to protect my interests. And any one of you would do the same, and anyone in the community also would do the same. I appreciate for your time. And you're off, and I appreciate if y'all have any questions, that y'all go ahead and put it in writing and send it to Mr. My attorney, to Mr. Henry LaFont. You dropped something, Mr. Martin. Pardon me? You, you yeah, dropped no. something. Right. <clears throat> any public comment? Okay. Permit committee is closed. Public comment is closed. Now we're going to commit to the executive committee. Members are Chucky Sherman, Chairman, Rodney Jusclair, Sr., Mike Colley, John Nelson, Jr. First, we have considered the, approving the amendment request from Galley Animal Service to extend a lease of site GLF 111. GLF 111 is the houseboat <laughs> lease. Um, recommendation to approve that extension. All right. Move. Move by Mr. Mellison, second by Mr. Chris Colley. Any discussion? Any public comment? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion passed. Next, we have considered approving the request from and hot water to sublease to clean waste a portion of site GLF 611. Okay, GLF 611 is an in hot water lease. Clean waste is operating on that facility and uh, is requesting to sublease that portion. Recommendation okay, I, to approve. I need a motion. Move. Move by Mike Cullis, second by Johnny Dordorn. Any discussion? Any public comment? All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passed. Next, we have consider approving the request from HOS 
port for basic renal deferral on lease side GLF 601 and GLF 602. All right. Um, for Hossport lease, uh, this is a request we've done this same situation in the past with uh, several other other tenants. It's a uh, basic rental deferral, 50% uh, basic rental for one year, and then uh, they would pay it out over um, about an uh, one one uh, lease is a seven-year period, and the other lease is about an eight-year period. Okay, need a motion. You got a motion from Larry uh, Griffin, mm -hmm. second by Curtis Pierce. Mm -hmm. Any discussion? Any public comment? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion pass. Next, we have consider approving the quest from EcoServe for basic and improvement rental deferral on lease side GLF 628. So EcoServe is a, is a twofold thing. First is um, their initial improvement, um, uh, basic, uh, their, their initial improvement uh, lease was for a 10 year uh, primary term. They're asking to extend it to a 15 year primary term. We've done that with other more recent leases. Uh, and then the other thing is, is the 50% uh, the deferral of the basic rent. Recommendation to approve. I need a motion. Moved by Mr. Rodney just clear, seconded by Jim Lafon. Any discussion? Any public comment? <coughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passed. Next, consider approving the cooperative endeavor agreement with West Bell Pass Headlands Restoration Corporation. Okay, so uh, as y'all are aware, the West Bell Pass uh, Headlands Restoration Corporation is an organization created by the Port Commission uh, to have the arch leases in and around the, the port area uh, so that we can do um, um, mitigation and marsh creation in those areas. Um, the Port Commission staff does the administrative services for the West Bell Pass Headland Restoration Corporation. That's what this cooperative, ende cooperative endeavor agreement talks about. Right. Need a motion. Moved by Mr. Johnny Ardorn, second by Chris Colley. Any discussion? Any public comment? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion passed. Next, consider purchasing the J. Wayne Plaisance office and warehouse. Okay, so that office and warehouse is uh, those two buildings right behind our office here. Um, Mr. Um, Brian LaRose um, put together this uh, appraisal for Mr. Plaisance for $310,000. We uh, had discussions back and forth with Mr. Plaisance and have agreed uh, for a $285,000 sales price. Need a motion. Mm. Move by Mr. Curtis Spears, second by Mike Colley. Any discussion? Any public comment? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion passed. Next, consider approving the policy manual revisions. Okay. Um, Miranda has been working uh, very hard on these uh, policy manual revisions. The majority, you can see in your packet, uh, we have several chapters that are being amended. Most of it deals with uh, civil service policies that were in our um, policy manual for years. We are no longer in civil service, so that's uh, the changes that are being made. Um, so, re recommendation to approve these Move. revisions. Moved by Mike Second. Culley, second by John Nelson. Any discussion? Any public comment? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion pass. Next, consider approving the surplus sale bids. All right, we had five items that were up for surplus sale, four vehicles, and one uh, old uh, fiber class hull. Um, we received bids on the four vehicles. Recommendation to approve the the uh, four high bids and to um, dispose of the fiber class. I need a motion. Moved by Larry Griffin, seconded by Rodney Justclair. Any discussion? Any public comment? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion passed. <coughs> Getting out of the executive committee, going into permits and waterways. Members are Curtis Pierce, Chairman, Jim Millafon, Johnny Ardon, and Chucky Sherman. Mr. Pierce. Thank you, Mr. President. We have one uh, permit review. And that's going to be for Loop LLC, installation of a new cathodic protection on the MOL modification to add 1,000 feet of electrical conduit and two poles in Lafourche Parish. And uh, if there's no other comment on that, that completes our report. Okay, thank, you. thank you, Mr. Pierce. Next, we're going to the Finance Committee. Members are John Melisson, Jr. Chairman, Rodney Jusclair, Sr., Mike Colley, Chuck Sheridan. Mr. Melisson, you up. Good morning and thank you, Mr. President. We'll begin by consider approving payments of the November 2020 invoices. 
and recognizing those over $10,000. Item one, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, $993,000 even, and that's for the MOA Bell Pass Emergency Dredge Project. Item two, Shaver's Widow Construction, $299,896.75, and that's for Slip C Phase 3, Bulkhead Part 1. Item three, Traveler's Insurance, $129,240 even, that's for the automobile insurance renewal. Item four, Pisciolos and Associates, $27,937.61. That is for the Flotation Canal Pavilion, along with other small projects. Item five, Angelette Pisciola LLC, $27,437.52. And that's for the Fouchon Bridge, Fouchon Island Conceptual Development, and Leeville. LA-1 Phase 2 Mitigation. Item 6, American Integration Contractors, $23,104.32. That's for security, camera, technical support. Item 7, Grand Isle Shipyard, $15,685. That's for labor at the airport. Item 8, Vision Communications, $13,504.71. That's for internet, phone, cable, <coughs> and fiber services. Item nine, Ascent Aviation Group, $11,318.28, and that's for truck rental and fuel resale at the airport. These expenditures along with the rest bring us to a total of $2,642,999.90. And Mr. President, I'd like to make a motion we accept these expenditures. I got a motion by Mr. Millison, second by Mr. Mike Colley. Any discussion, any public comment? All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passed. Next on the agenda, as discussed in Monday night's committee meeting, we need to consider approving the November 2020 unaudited financial statements, and I'd like to make a motion we accept these. I got a motion by Mr. Mellison, second by Mr. Larry Griffin. Any discussion? Any public comment? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion passed. Next, we have consider approving the 2020 budget amendments, and I'll turn that over to Director Chasson this time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the 2020 uh, budget had to be amended, because uh, as, as you all are very aware, um, in 2020, we did some uh, rental deferrals and some reductions uh, that caused a considerable amount of uh, change into our budget and our budgeted revenues, um, as well as uh, in return, the expenses, the landowner rental expenses paid out was, was less. And then um, some of the projects that we um, didn't get to fully complete, we didn't receive those grant funding for those capital construction projects. So that made some changes, considerable changes to our amendment, uh, to our budget, so we have to amend it. You have any comments to that? Um, no, sir. Just the reduction from net income was, like you said, the, um, the three month um, basic rent deferral, um, also the landowner expense associated with that and the grants. And that gave us um, a $10 million change to our net income. So our um, ending amended net income is about $1,023,985 for the amendment. Right. Need a motion. Moved by Mr. Curtis Jessica, second by Johnny Ardorn. Any discussion? Curtis Pierce. Curtis Pierce, Curtis I'm Pierce. sorry. <laughs> hey, we're trying to slide this thing through. Good, <laughs> Bob. Yeah. Uh, I got a second. Any discussion? Any public comment? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion passed. Oh, and next. There's a joint motion. <laughs> yeah. And next, we have consider approving the 2021 budget. And once again, I'll turn that over to Mr. Chasson and Ms. Parker. All right. Miranda, go ahead. Okay, so we'll begin on page one. We'll go over that um, summary there. So we're anticipating our revenues um, budgeted for 2021 to be around $26,176,789. And that is about a $4.8 million increase from our projected for 2020. Um, and remember, like we just mentioned in our amendment, we had those basic rent deferrals that we did um, as a concession for our tenants. So that's why our projected is lower and we have the increase in of the 26 million in 2021. 
Um, and that is included in any concessions that we are doing for tenants currently in 2021 due to the state of oil and gas. Deducted from that are our direct costs, which include landowner expense, depreciation of improvements, and this also again is associated with the lease revenue increase, so we also have an increase in our landowner expense. Our total landowner expense is anticipated to be $9,890,629, which is about a $925,000 increase from our projected 2020. So this will give us our gross profit, which we anticipate being around $16,286,000. This is a $3.9 million increase from 2020 projected. We would deduct our expenses. These expenses are for admin, operations, um, Harbor Police, and we anticipate those being around $16,439,909, and that is a $3.3 million increase, but a portion, a large portion of that, and the reason for that is that we include maintenance projects in this number, and this, a large portion of that is the maintenance project for Flotation Canal and Front Marina Maintenance Dredge. So from there, we get our operating loss for the year that we're anticipating to be around 153,000, but you add to that your non-operating revenues and expenses, and we anticipate a revenue of $9,535,570, and you can see the detail to that on page 17. I'll briefly go over some of those details. And included in that number are our ad valorem tax revenue, which is anticipated to be about 3.7. Also, you deduct your uncollectible and um, your sheriff's pension. Uh, state revenue sharing is anticipated to be around 35,000. And then we add in our grants for capital construction projects. This is the grant money we anticipate receiving from Port Priority, Capital Outlay, DOTD, that's anticipated to be around $18,479,794. And also added to that is our grant operating and maintenance revenue, basically from um, LADOTD for the airport for $459,000. Right below that, you'll see we add in our interest, our anticipated interest earned, and that's pretty conservative this year considering interest rates are pretty low, about $800,000. And right below that, you'll see the emergency d disaster contingency of 5% of our operating and capital budget. So we take our operating and capital expenditures, we take 5% of that, and we reserve those funds in case we have an incident that occurs that we need to use it. And right below that are our special items. Um, these are typically projects that are within management's control of agreements that we've um, agreed to contribute to certain projects and things. Um, we do have $2 million for the beach restoration project, um, also the LA1 phase 2 contribution of the $5 million, which we've discussed, this is the first of five payments, um, the LA1 mitigation dredge phase 2, and also um, the Bayou Lafourche flotation canal um, in conjunction with CPRA of $1.2 million, the dredging. And if you go back to page 1 for me. That brings us to our net income, which we anticipate to be around $9,381,821. And from there, right below that, you'll see our statement of cash flows. We anticipate beginning 2021 with $125 million around, maybe a little bit less. Um, from there, you would add in your net income from the top of the $9.3 million. And you would also add in your depreciation expense of 7.8. And then deduct our total capital assets that will be purchased or intended to be purchased of 1.5 million. And you also deduct the total cost of capital projects, which is anticipated to be around $41,652,931. And then you would add in the increase or decrease in deferred revenues, which we, we expect a decrease. This is our advanced improvement rent that we deduct from every year. And then you also add in your decrease of other payables, which is anticipated to be around 131,000. And we're gonna add in our increase of our other receivables, which is typically our port priority money that'll come in um, in phases of 4 million. And that'll give us an expected ending cash of around $93,135,401. And 
And from there, we of course deduct um, the expenses of what we plan to spend 50 million on the development of Fushan Island to give us an ending cash of around $43 million. And I think that Chet would like to maybe go over some of the major projects that are in the details behind this summary. Well, we've, we've, we've gone through that a lot. I mean, uh, we're con gonna continue to do the major projects that we always do. Um, we have some bulkhead in there. Um, a lot of, uh, you're gonna see at the end, a lot of our, uh, we talked about n large number of capital construction projects, a uh, large amount of dollars, but um, note that 13 million of it is one project and that's the dredging work that we're gonna be doing in Slip D uh, and Bayou Lafouche, which is gonna complete all of our mitigation <coughs> requirements for that development. Um, and we're gonna continue to do um, other projects that go along with that. So I'll just leave it at that. Okay. All right. We Keep have any motion. other questions for Ms. Parker? Wait, you wanna- Yeah, I wanna go yeah, over final, the total okay. expenses, the, total. the total expense budget. Yeah. All right. Okay, so we expect our total operating expenses to be around $26,330,538. Our total capital expenses around $43,202,194 to give us a total um, non-operating expense of $69,532,732,732. $69, and then right below that, um, <coughs> our non-operating expenses of $13,426,637 to give us a total budget for the year of $82,959,369. And with that, I'll ask if we have any questions for Ms. Parker. <laughs> Ms. Parker, along with Mr. Sheremy and the rest of the commission, we've been going over this budget for the last three months with you guys and you did a wonderful job with COVID, the ups, the downs, the highs, the lows. And uh, y'all did a wonderful job. And as a board, we really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Amanda. Yes, sir. Appreciate it. <laughs> All right, get a motion. Move. Moved by Mike Colley, second by John Nellison. Any discussion? Any public comment? All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passed. Before I exit committee, Mr. President, I'd like to welcome Mr. Monty Vague, Mr. Keith Guidry, and the newest member of the South Lafouche Levy Board, Mr. Brian Martz. Thank, Thank you, you for, for attending our meeting today. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. President, this concludes the financial report. All right. And we're getting out of any other business. Public comment. Hi, uh, I'd like to wish everybody a Merry Christmas. Being this yeah, I was going to let everybody go wrong, Mr. Larry. Oh, okay. We can start with the oh, cutest yeah. one, we can start. Yeah. Yeah. Start with, uh, okay, well, I want to wish everybody and your family, your families, a Merry Christmas. And uh, always remember, Jesus is the reason for the season. Thank you all. Mr. Ordorn. Yeah, uh, again, wish everyone a Merry Christmas. Thank you all for attending our meetings. We really appreciate it. Mr. LaFont. Wish everyone a Merry Christmas. And uh, good luck to our president for our next year. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Jusclair. Wishing everyone a very merry and blessed Christmas this year. And uh, good luck. Hopefully 2021 uh, we can see a brighter future. Mr. Pierce. Yeah, I want to wish everyone a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year and uh, be safe. <laughs> All right. Mr. Millison. I'd like to wish everyone Merry Christmas, and I'd like to offer our condolences to the Boulay family. Uh, Henri's father passed away over the weekend, and uh, we wish him and his family the best of luck, and I'd like to wish everyone a Merry Christmas. Mr. Cully. Uh, blessed Christmas to everybody, and a great 2021. Mr. Utter, Mr. Cully. <laughs> Thank you, Chucky. Uh, just a Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to everyone out there. Remember to stay safe, protect yourself, protect your families, and uh, look forward to a brighter 2021. Thank you. On behalf of my family, I wish everyone a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year on behalf of the port and the employees. We've had a, a rough year, but you know what? We did it. Nobody can say that. We still survived. Everything is good. We had some ups and downs, but we got through it. So. To the employees, everybody, hopefully next year we have a better year. And everyone have a merry Christmas and a happy New Year's. 
from uh, I know I got a new child, a new granddaughter in this world, so I got reason to live now, even more. <laughs> so, all right, need a motion. Moved by Mr. Jim Lafon, second by Johnny Ardon. Any discussion? Any public comment? All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passed. The meeting adjourned. Thanks everyone for coming over here to this meeting. <laughs>